Ladies and gentlemen, dear viewers, on behalf of the Europa Institute at the University of Zurich, the Swiss Embassy in the United States, and for the first time, the in cooperation with the BMW Center for German and European Studies at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., I would like to welcome you to our 2021-22 Swiss Day. We have been doing this Swiss Day now for about seven years years and the purpose of the event is to discuss topics of common interest for the United States and Switzerland. While in previous years the Swiss Day took place live in Washington DC in the Ronald Reagan building, this is the second time that we are using the internet instead. Besides some elements of course we are missing dearly, this format also has one big advantage. The viewers from all around the US and Switzerland can comfortably participate from home or office, and therefore we are expecting a much bigger audience than before. This year's topic is education, and we want to talk about the different education systems in the US and in Switzerland. Advantages disadvantages and current challenges. We are having very attractive speakers tonight, but before I will hand over the microphone to them, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Jacques Pitlou, Ambassador of Switzerland to the United States and co-sponsor of this event tonight. Please, Mr. Ambassador. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Kellerhals, for that introduction. I'm, of course, uh, delighted to be with you to, to tonight, in your case, to today uh, in Washington, D.C. Last November, we were fortunate enough to have the visit of the president of the Confederation, uh, Mr. Guy Parmelin, and he was here to sign two memoranda of understanding. One expressed the will to continue and expand Swiss-American collaboration in the area of vocational education, apprenticeship, which is something where probably the US kind of lags behind uh, the, the, the behind Switzerland. And also the other MOU was between the US and the Swiss National Science Foundation, so between the, the US and the Swiss National uh, Science Foundations, to create the basis for long-term cooperation uh, and to pursue projects with partners in, in, both, uh, in both countries. These are the, just the most rec recent examples uh, in the long history of cooperation between uh, Switzerland and the US in terms of education. Through Switzerland, uh, though Switzerland's educational system characterized by a high degree of permeability is quite different from its American counterpart, we also share a number of similarities. Both our countries are home to universities that do top the global rankings, and they are consistently hailed as worldwide leaders in innovation. We also share the values of academic freedom, openness, and international mobility. Exchange and mobility between our countries is very strong with the US, is number one, is the number one destination country for Swiss PhD and all uh, Swiss PhD students, and all major Swiss universities have cooperation programs and exchange programs with American counterparts, many, many of them. And I could give you, you know, dozens of examples of incredible cooperation between, between uh, universities in Switzerland and, and, and the, in the US, starting with uh, the, the, the biggest neutron collisioner being built uh, in Chicago with the help of the University of Bern. I mean, you know, there are so many, so many examples of fundamental science, uh, uh, and not just science, where, where, where the cooperation is excellent. Of course, if I would be remiss in my duties as an ambassador if I did not take this opportunity to highlight the importance, the breadth, and the depth of the Swiss-US bilateral relation in general. We Swiss have more than just some political similarities uh, and, and, and democratic values in common with our sister republic. We also share an innovative spirit which drives research and discovery. And uh, I might add maybe also a certain belief in, in the forces of the free market, which tends to be uh, under attack uh, right now. Um, but this spirit is particularly visible 
in our respective educational institutions. So the MOU signings were just the latest steps taken in pursuit of Swiss-US cooperation in education and research, and they will most certainly not be the last. An important topic and focus of today's conversation is on Switzerland and the USA's shared challenges in the field of education, among them, how to prepare students for a rapidly changing world, sustainability, innovation, equity, inclusion, and so many others. Those working on the front lines to prepare the next generations are doing truly important work and their devotion to the cause should give us all reason to be optimistic about the future. We are still, you know, our two countries are still uh, ranking top and we should be proud about it. But at, at least from the Swiss perspective, the moment you are leading, that's the moment when you're starting to worry about tomorrow. That's the way we Swiss are. So today you'll hear from experts in the field, and we have an incredibly esteemed group with us today. Uh, they each contribute to this, to this discussion from a different uh, point of view and different perspective. And I look forward to hearing from uh, all of them. Dr. Gabriele Sigurd from the University of Zurich, alongside Dr. Randall Bass and Dr. Katrin Sieg from Georgetown University here in Washington, D.C. I'm also pleased that my colleague, Anouk de Bast, head of the embassy's science office, will moderate the discussion. One last note on Swiss-US co co collaboration. On behalf of myself and the embassy staff, I want to thank Professor Andreas Kellerhals uh, and, his, and, and of course his fantastic colleagues at the European Institute for their partnership over the years. I would also like to thank the BMW Center for uh, German and European Studies at Georgetown University for its cooperation with us. This event serves as something of a launch and celebration of the new relationship with the BMW Center. And uh, this new relationship so will, will, will starts with the fact that the BMW Center will host uh, two Swiss scholars in residence per year, and we are very grateful for that. We look forward to years of fruitful co cooperation to come, and we, we are grateful to have kept the Swiss day and our, our cooperation going in spite, in spite of COVID and in spite of all this thing uh, being virtual. As you said, it guarantees a better audience. But on the other hand, we, we are missing, and I hope you are missing, the reception at, at the Swiss <laughs> residence. So that said, no, thank you very much for uh, uh, organizing, co-organizing uh, this. The future in the 21st century will belong to those countries that will understand how important scientific cooperation is. And at a time when we witness, unfortunately, many, many countries shutting down the doors and, and actually uh, uh, trying to control uh, every data coming out and trying to get as many in as possible, by the way, uh, and we truly believe, we truly believe that Switzerland and the US have a role to play in creating the kind of scientific environment that will make it possible for us to uh, tackle the challenges of the 21st century, and there will be many. So thank you so much and have a great meeting. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador, for the introductory remarks. Of course, we are dearly missing the personal contacts as we had them in the past, and we are very much looking forward to a reception at your embassy uh, hopefully in fall of this year. Thank you so uh, much. Now I'd like to introduce our, our first speaker, Professor uh, Gabriele Sieger, Deputy President and Vice President Education Student Affairs of the University of Zurich. Uh, Gabriele is going to speak about challenges uh, of educational system in Switzerland today. Please, Gabriele. So I try to share my screen one moment, please. So this would be it now. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to this event and I'm uh, looking forward to talking about the Swiss education system. My presentation is divided into two parts. Uh, let's see. First, I will talk about the Swiss education system in general. And in the second part, I will talk about some challenges, sorry, some challenges for higher education. 
So let's start with the Swiss education system. And with, let's start with money, more precisely with education expenditure. According to the OECD, Switzerland's total education expenditure corresponds to 4.6% of its GDP, just under the average of OECD countries. However, a different picture emerges if we relate national education expenditure to the total number of people undergoing education and training. Then Switzerland has the second highest level of ex, uh, expenditure on education and training each year worldwide. For those of you who are not very familiar with Switzerland, I would like to mention that Switzerland has a population of just under 9 million and is divided into 26 cantons. Why do I mention this? The Swiss education system is to a large extent a cantonal matter. And 26 cantons, that means it is rich in variety and it is a complex matter. However, it is characterized by a high degree of flexibility for it is a very open system. After, after leaving the compulsory school, there are many ways to begin or to change to a different education program, to enter or to transfer to a training program or school. Anyone who has the necessary qualifications can generally attend the course of his or her choice. After the end of their compulsory education, you see that here, Roughly two thirds of young people in Switzerland switch to a form of education which combines classroom instruction at a vocational school with an apprenticeship in a training company. That was already mentioned. Those who gain a baccalaureate can freely choose their study program at a university, but more of universities later. Altogether, more than 90% of young people complete upper secondary education. And also, as already mentioned, Switzerland has a strong and highly reputational vocational education. However, there are some restrictions due to ceilings on apprenticeship positions. Only one third of a cohort, and that depends on the canton, graduate with a baccalaureate and choose to study at a university. Education in Switzerland is altogether highly valued. The federal government and the cantons offer a comprehensive public education, which is completely or almost, almost free for students. That means compulsory school is free, vocational training is free, general education here is free. Or for example, at the University of Zurich, interested young people pay 100 Swiss francs, that equals about 100 US dollars, as an application fee. And they pay a tuition fee of 720 francs dollars per semester. We have all together, I have a slide for that. As you can see on the figures, 10 universities and two federal institutes of technology. You see that on the left figure. We have eight public universities of applied sciences and arts and one private one. And we have 16 universities of education. And you see on the left slide, there is kind of a cluster around the Zurich area. When it comes to higher education, there are a few 
admission, let's see, admission policy principles, and they differ from other countries. Therefore, I like to briefly mention them. The student's admission demands a Swiss baccalaureate or an equivalent foreign certificate. Every student with a sufficient degree is entitled to be admitted to university. Universities are obliged to enroll all students qualified for and interested in bachelor studies. There's only one exception. Everything that has to do with medicine is kind of restricted, that you have to pass an extra test before being allowed to study medicine that includes human medicine, uh, chiropractic, uh, veterinary medicine, and dentistry. Bachelors, graduates from other Swiss universities must be admitted regardless of the type and origin of their previous educational qualification. You saw the various links on the other figure, and these are the links. This is the permeability of the system. In addition, the master's degree is still seen as a rule in university education. Holders of a bachelor's degree have guaranteed access to master's level education within their respected field of study. That does not include special, specialized master programs. And based on a list specifying the permeability between subjects and types of higher education institutions is granted. We teach the teaching is based on a three stage Bologna's model which consists of a bachelor level after three years, a master's level after four or five years, and the possibility to get a doctor's degree providing the master's level has been successful. And as already mentioned, education is generally inexpensive for Swiss students as the system relies most entirely on public funds from the cantons and the national, and the national governance. so much for the Swiss education system in general. I would now like to move on to the second part of the challenges and I focus on higher education. I would speak about four challenges that will determine the core business of higher education in the future, not only in Switzerland. Challenges similar to those found you can find them in the papers of international higher education associations. The challenges are not entirely new. We know some of them, but they will gain, gain momentum, in my opinion. I call them transformative and engaged, shaping the future of society, accessible and transparent, disclosing actions and results, open minded and transdisciplinary eliminating boundaries and connective and trans transnational joining forces. And I'll talk briefly about each of these challenges. First of all, transformative and engaged shaping the future of society. In the future, universities have to continue to research socially relevant topics, contribute their expertise in tackling the growing global challenges, take these into account in their teaching and seek, in a broad sense, dialogue and discourse with civil society. In other words, universities must see themselves even more than before, even more than now, as a transformative force that helps shape society. What does this mean, mean for universities' core business? Very briefly, stimulating discourse actively accompanying change, enabling participation and involvement, and enabling lifelong learning. Exam examples for that would be additional programs for children, children's university, or additional programs for seniors, continuing education programs for those in the workforce, keyword would be reskilling and upskilling, or citizen science activities. 
accessible and transparent, disclosing actions and results. Universities must make their scientific achievements and results as well as the corresponding research processes, the methods, and data more transparent than before. The key word is open science. Open science does not only mean open access to publications, but refers to a comprehensive and collaborative scientific practice, which also includes open research data and open educational resources. This re requires support from the universities, such as repositories, repositories or other infrastructures. And yes, it also means a change in attitude. And I'm not naive, I'm also aware that there is competition among researchers and that researchers need to be able to process and exploit their data before it can be made fully accessible. But nevertheless, we should make them accessible at a certain point in time. And because the integrity of research is becoming more important, reproducible science or the rep reproducibility of research results is also becoming more important. The third one is open-minded and transdisciplinary, eliminating boundaries. Let me start with the following. Disciplinary orientation is important. It is the scientific home of the researchers and lecturers, and a successful academic career can often only succeed if the individuals deepen and specialize in their own discipline. But individual disciplines can solve the so-called real-world problems and global challenges, such as those manifested in the UN Sustainable Development Goals, less and less on their own. In most cases, they contribute a more or less large piece of the puzzle, puzzle to the solution, but only a piece of the puzzle. To address these so-called grand challenges on a larger scale, transdisciplinarity is needed. Transdisciplinarity understood as an approach that combines different perspectives and disciplines, links scientific knowledge and knowledge from society, and above all, deals with questions that arise from real life situations. Universities must therefore break away from disciplinary silos and move toward more, towards more interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity in research and in teaching. Connective and transnational joining forces. The different types of universities in Switzerland and abroad have a more or less clear and distinct distinguishable mission. And of course, there is competition. We don't have to deny that. And of course, competition is a good thing to a certain extent because competition stimulates business and motivates to a certain extent. But the challenges are too great and the resources too limited for the universities of the future to afford to act as lone wolves, neither in Switzerland nor in the international context. Rather, universities must join forces to jointly increase the impact of their activities. They must form strong alliances and collaboration. And digitalization helps to bring those international collaborations closer to the real world working activities. Ladies and gentlemen, many steps have been taken to address these challenges, but there is still quite a way to go. University management must prepare for this and that requires good university leadership. But if I start talking about leadership, my colleague, Professor Randall Bass, doesn't get a word in edgewise at all. Therefore, with an image of the University of Zurich and the Federal Institute of Technology Zurich, I thank you for the attention and hand back to Andy Kellerhaus. Thank you very much, Gabriele, for this very comprehensive presentation on the Swiss education educational uh, system. Now we move on to our second speaker. Uh, this will be Professor Randall Bass, Vice President for Strategic Education of the Georgetown University. His topic is equal opportunities in education, access to education in the United States. 
Please, Randall, go ahead. Well, thank you very much, Professor Keller-Halls, and thank you, Professor Siegert, for a wonderful presentation. Um, I think our, our presentations will complement each other in, in wonderful ways. And thank you to all of the organizers of, of Swiss Day. I'm very honored to be here. Uh, now, let me uh, switch over to my slides. That'll be a two-step process here, but if you just bear with me. Um, Okay, so I will be giving the U.S. perspective, and I'm, I've am i structured my presentation uh, similarly to Professor Siegert's, although I'll be not quite as well organized. Um, but I think we're, we're moving in the very same direction with lots of connections. I wanted to begin uh, by quoting a book that very recently came out that seemed very resonant with today's event. Uh, it was written um, primarily by Ronald Daniels, who is the professor of the Johns Hopkins University uh, in the United States, and it's called What Universities Owe Democracy. And in the book, he talks about four key functions of American higher education, um, many of which, of course, overlap with the Swiss, uh, social mobility, citizenship education, the stewardship of facts and truth, uh, and the cultivation of pluralistic, diverse communities. And it felt appropriate to begin with these four goals because um, I think that they are in many ways the ideals that are shared between the US and the Swiss. And in the book, uh, President Daniels talks about these goals, but that US higher education is not meeting the challenge in any one of those four areas. And that's really what motivates him. He's particularly motivated, and the ambassador spoke, uh, touched on this, motivated by what he would call this moment as a perilous moment for democracy. Uh, and he says, in order to respond to that, universities cannot be complacent. They must look hard at who they admit, how they teach, how they explore and share knowledge, and how they connect their discoveries with the teeming diverse world beyond their walls. In this light, the relevant question is not, how do we shape society to nourish the university, but rather, how does the university best foster democracy in our society? So that feels like the appropriate door into this uh, brief presentation. And now let me talk a little bit about the US context and the US system of higher education um, in parallel to Professor Siegert's, keeping that in mind, the context for university shaped for democracy. So first to talk about the US higher education system, I'll quote, um, one of my favorite authors who uh, is a historian of education and wrote a book a few years ago about the U.S. higher education system called A Perfect Mess. Um, and he would describe, he describes the U.S. higher education system as a system without a plan, which strikes me as being quite um, the antithesis of the Swiss system. Uh, he also describes that there's a fundamental tension in the U.S. system between social accessibility, the broad democratic reach, and social exclusivity, which speaks to our liberalist uh, tendencies toward individualism and mobility. And here he says, what allows us to accommodate both our democratic and our liberal tendencies in higher education is stratification. We can make universities both accessible and elite by creating a pyramid of institutions in which access is inclusive at the bottom and exclusive at the top. Such a system simultaneously extends opportunity and protects privilege. This comes out looking, as he says, something like a pyramid. And here's a, a diagram of the US education system. Um, and as with the Swiss, there are, of course, many ways and places to go after you leave secondary school, um, including into vocational and technical, though, as the ambassador noted, not nearly well as developed as the apprenticeship systems in Switzerland, community colleges, and a variety of undergraduate programs, and then on up into doctoral studies. Research-intensive universities, as most places, along with small private liberal arts colleges, sit at the top of this stratified system. They have most of the resources, and they confer most of the social advantage. And yet, more than 50%, of um, students in the country are in the vocational and community colleges 
or what we might call broad access institutions. They sit at the bottom of the pyramid, both in terms of the numbers of resources and in terms of their social advantage. Um, theoretically, our system has the same kind of permeability as the Swiss system, but structural inequalities in our society, um, uh, the decline of state support, significant decline of public dollars to higher education, and the pervasiveness over the last few decades of coming to see education as a private good and not a public good have all made the permeability and the mobility of the system very challenged. Uh, this is put quite sharply and bluntly by the uh, well-known historian of higher education, Chad Wellman, who wrote a piece in a, the Chronicle of Higher Education recently called The Crushing Contradictions of the American University. He said, American higher education has produced many goods, but it also launders privilege, luck of birth and circumstance, and financial and social greed into socially acceptable status under the rubric of merit. And it now exacerbates persistent and worsening financial and social inequalities. So that's a very blunt uh, comment, um, but I, I, I thought it was worth sharing. And it is also borne out by the data. So this is a, a chart of uh, attainment of higher education in the United States by quartiles of socioeconomic status. So if you look in the 1960s, um, the lowest socioeconomic uh, quartile had about 6% attainment and the highest had about 40%. 20 years later, the highest had grown to over 60% and the lowest socioeconomic quartile remained flatlined. Um, this now is jumping ahead to the great global recession in which the highest took a little bit of a dip, but the lowest remains the same. And if you look at the current situation, it appears that the lowest quartile is taking a slight uptick, and we'll see if that continues. And that might be the case because of enormous work that's gone on in the United States around what might be called student success, not just access, but helping through to persistence to graduation. But it remains to be seen if that uptick will last. We know that it is being challenged by the pandemic. Um, since 2019, meaning the effect of the pandemic closures and whatnot, enrollment in US universities is down about 6%, which means that we've lost almost a half a million students from the system, and that the vast majority of that drop has been at the widest access institutions at the pyramid. So as this headline indicates, the most vulnerable are the ones who have left the system by and large. So all of that speaks really to then, as I turn to thinking about challenges, um, to what many have called for a long time, the iron triangle, um, the idea of how do we achieve quality, access, and affordability meaning controlling costs both to the consumer and to the institution. That that, what uh, Steve Ehrman in a recent book calls the threefold change, being able to achieve all three of those at once is what's called, known as the iron triangle. And there may be nothing more important for higher education in the, in the next couple of decades than to take on this iron triangle the way we would take on um, other major complex challenges. And in fact, to consider it in, in a sense a wicked problem and not an easily fixable problem. So as I talk a little bit more about challenges in the last part of my presentation, I want to put this in a broader perspective. A lot of my work is thinking about how this moment we're in, and in some ways the pandemic, really comes in the middle of, a, of at least a 50-year shift. Uh, periodization is always tricky, but there's reasons to begin this shift around 1990 and to think forward a couple of decades. And I think this shift is characterized by at least two major revolutions. The digital revolution, which of course we don't need to spend time on, we're all familiar with, but also the human revolution. What we've learned in the last 20 or 30 years about human capacity, um, human learning, uh, and, and the nature of, of how humans develop, it seems to me as is, is as important a, a revolution as the digital one. Both of these come together in what I think of as the new learning paradigm. 
And let me give you just four characteristics of the new learning paradigm. I think these will comport very well with um, um, Professor Siegert's very uh, wonderful comprehensive structure that you gave us. So first, we know from a significant base of evidence that active learning, inclusive and holistic teaching significantly improves learning. That is, that the quality of teaching and learning design improves learning. That may seem obvious, but actually it's only in the last couple of decades that we actually have the evidentiary base that the nature of teaching and learning design actually improves student learning. This is part of the new paradigm. We know that cognitive and academic learning is not enough, that we have to educate the whole person. What we have learned about socio-emotional learning, about resilience, about empathy, about creativity, about humility, um, are all not only that these are qualities that are good for people to have, but that they're actually constitutive of intelligence and of knowledge and of success, and that these need to be very much designed into everything that we imagine what an education can be. We now know that the skills of the future cannot be formed in traditional classrooms alone and they must be cultivated through experience. And finally, we now know that the world's most complex challenges will require interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary thought, creativity, and action, just as uh, Professor Siegert was emphasizing. Just a few more slides and I'll finish. I see uh, Professor Keller Hall's uh, coming into the screen, which must mean that I'm close to being played off. Um, <laughs> um, so a question I like to ask often is if we were designing higher education for this moment in history without any legacies, what would it look like? And when I ask this question every semester in a class that I teach called the university as a design problem, we tell the students that if you're designing for 20 years from now or more, you're no longer designing for content, you're designing for context. So what will the conditions of knowledge, technology, learning and work be like in 20 years and what kind of graduate would we want to produce, right? So what do we know about the future? We know that it'll be filled with a variety of existential threats uh, that I think we can talk about in the final discussion. But obviously these are all threats that we share, US and Switzerland. We know that it will significantly reshape the future of human work. Um, Levy and Murnane, who did some of this earliest work in the 2000s, say that in the future, the very near future, the human labor market will center on only three kinds of work, solving unstructured problems, working with new complex information, and carrying out non-routine manual tasks. Every other kind of work will be done by robots or by low-level manual labor. So these are the kinds of skills we need to educate students for. And this is the argument that Joseph Aoun makes in his book, Robot Proof, where he says that the only way to really robot-proof students for the future is to ground their education in experience, in unstructured problems, and mentored learning through very volatile, uncertain circumstances. He says, no computer has yet displayed creativity, entrepreneurialism, or cultural agility. And although machines are continuously improving in their ability to map knowledge onto recognizable problems, in other words, what he calls near transfer, they cannot perform far transfer well, at least not in the infinite context of real life. So for me, this is the final challenge of when we think about the challenges of education. It is not whether machines will get better at being human, but we know that machines are going to get better at being machines. And the question is, is higher education prepared to help humans get better at being human? So in my closing, these are my last four thoughts about how to respond to the challenges for higher education. One, take on this iron triangle, quality access and affordability, again, as if it were a grand challenge, as if it were climate change, as if it were cancer. Expand evidence-based teaching and learning practices to align with the world's needs. Our universities are not at the moment built in optimal ways for the kind of education that the world is asking for at the moment. Push the frontiers of human intelligence, thinking not only about human capacity, but the relationship of human intelligence to machine learning, 
but also to what we're learning about natural intelligence, mycelial networks, and other aspects of nature we didn't know 20 years ago. And finally, liberate our conception of quality education from its historical exclusions, rooted in racialized hierarchies, rooted in a Cartesian split between head and heart, and the separation of humans from the environment. Final slide. Michael Crow and his co-authors say in their recent book, The Fifth Wave of Higher Education, America's future depends on embracing the idea that excellence and access in higher education are not incompatible, but synergistic. And that to me captures this paradigm shift and the challenge that's facing us in the decades ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Randy, for this excellent presentation. Also, of course, for, for providing us with a wonderful list of books we urgently have to read. All those five or six books are, are extremely interesting and we're going to, to buy them uh, uh, tomorrow. So thank you very much. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the two speakers have now laid the floor for the following panel discussion, which will be hosted by Anouk de Bas. Um, Anouk is the head of the science office at the Swiss Embassy uh, in Washington, D.C. and would like to thank her very much for taking on this task. The panel will be joined by Professor Katrin Sieg, director of the BMW Center for German and European Studies at Georgetown University. We are delighted to have her um, on, on that panel as the head of our new partner institution. Thank you very much, uh, Katrin, for uh, doing that. The panel discussion will last about 30 minutes. Now, please, Anouk, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, and uh, good evening to, to Zurich. Good uh, afternoon to the people listening from us from the US. My name is Anouk Debes. I'm the head of science, uh, the science office here in Washington, DC. And, uh, as uh, was mentioned before, I will be moderating uh, this discussion and also be your main timekeeper uh, and uh, closing the discussion at the end. We have a lot of uh, interesting uh, food for thought that has been uh, presented in the two first presentation. And I also would like to encourage you um, to ask a question online. If you have any question for our uh, two uh, speakers today, uh, we would very much welcome them. Um, it's my pleasure to also uh, welcome the new panelists here, uh, Catherine uh, Sieg. Um, um, Catherine Sieg is a Graffold professor. She is the director of the BMW Center for German and European Studies at Georgetown University. She is a theater scholar uh, by training and an expert on German the uh, theater. I'm very, very curious about that and um, about uh, also an expert on, on country. Um, European culture. So, Prof uh, Professor Sieg, I would like to, for, to, to first start with you. Uh, your center is bridging the German-speaking uh, and the American culture. Uh, could you give us a couple of uh, general feedback and your impression on these two first presentations? Yes, thank you so much, Anouk. Um, and thank you to both panelists for really wonderful presentations that complemented each other really well. Um, so I actually, um, I, I could um, kind of give you some examples of how these very large philosophical uh, questions play out, you know, on a smaller scale in my center, but I thought I would actually uh, frame my, my contribution in terms of two questions that I would like to ask uh, the two panelists. Um, uh, and to Professor Siegert, I want to ask her, um, that I really appreciated her emphasis on the permeability of the Swiss educational system, uh, which allows you to be both very innovative and to ensure broad access uh, and social mobility at the same time. Now, I was actually uh, born and raised in Germany, which has to some degree a similar uh, educational system with, uh, with the vocational tracks and, the, and similar kind of large public universities uh, that are very accessible. Um, but I think uh, where the, the crux of the matter is, is how newcomers to Switzerland, that is migrants and refugees and their children, for instance, how do they benefit from the innovation, the broad access and the social mobility that is promised to uh, Swiss citizens? 
and how do they how are they empowered uh, to benefit from these features of your system. Um, in Germany, I observe that very often migrants and, um, and their children are tracked into vocational training uh, and away from university training and advanced degrees. Um, and I was wondering if that is to some degree also uh, what's happening in Switzerland. And if so, how, how does your system accommodate you know, matters of equity? How are they, how can you change uh, that kind of and democratize the, the educational system in that way. Um, and then uh, also knowing a little bit more about the uh, German secondary uh, educational system, I observed that over the last 10, 20 years, that there's been quite a remarkable growth of private schools that somehow undermine, or to, to that some degree undermine the nice kind of democratic broad access promised by the public educational system. So that's my, kind of big question to Professor Siegert. And then to Professor Bass, um, I uh, also want to express you know, my appreciation for your wonderful uh, presentation on how, uh, on how universities fall short of these, uh, um, you know, the, the requirement to do, uh, or what they should give to democracies, what universities owe democracies, that is both to ensure access and also excellence at the same time. And you kind of come in your presentation to the final assertion that, that they should. Now, as a director of a center, I'm also directly you know, affected by these matters. And um, uh, we have been in the fallout uh, from the discussion of uh, the killing of George Floyd uh, two years ago. And there's been broad discussion of decolonizing the university and, uh, and democratizing it also. And um, but we are re really hitting roadblocks in terms of uh, overcoming the structural problem of stratification that you outlined so beautifully. So we have made efforts to alter our pedagogies. We've made efforts to alter our curricula and decolonize our curricula. Uh, we, um, we can also alter whom we invite to uh, to get short term teaching contracts. Of course, it's very difficult to affect long term kind of durable, you know, changes to the demographics of the faculty body. Um, um, but we can, you know, have an effect on who we invite to speak at public events. So in all these cases, kind of diversity, equity, and, ex and inclusion are very relevant uh, to what we're doing and how we become conscious of our, you know, debt of democratization to society. Um, but how do we alter the demographics of uh, students? How do we alter the demographics of faculty since they're so so intimately tied to structures of privilege and class uh, class inequality in the United States? So uh, we find ourselves really stumped by this problem. And of course, we're encouraged to do fundraising in order to raise money for, uh, for student scholarships, but uh, in education at Georgetown University and at many other kind of elite universities uh, is extremely expensive. And so and that's, uh, to us, that's a really a huge challenge to overcome that. So those are my big kind of questions or um, yeah, invitations to kind of explore this further. Thank you. Professor Siegert, would you, ladies first, would you like to start? <laughs> yes, so Karen, thank, uh, Katrin, thank you very much for the question. So I would like to mention that I'm a double citizen. Uh, I'm German and Swiss, so I know the German system very uh, well. And I, uh, in my opinion, the Swiss system is much more open, much more interlinked, and vocational education is much more valued be it uh, depending on your position in society, be it uh, on the, your income you're able to, to gain in your whole life. You know, I have uh, a lot of friends, craftsmen, very educated craftsmen. I mean, you have craftsmen that speak German, uh, English, French fluently and, and make a career in the United States, for example, and Switzerland. There are a lot of, lot of possibilities to make a career and the Swiss system is really an open, an open system. However, there is a huge problem that is the selection into high school. You still have to pass a, a, a test before you come from, uh, from school to high school. And of course, there are a lot of wealthy parents that can afford to send their children, which are not able to pass the test, 
into private schools. That is, of course, uh, the case. Yes, it is that way. And we have to think about, uh, about the access to high school, not so much to university, but if, because if you have graduated from high school, you can access the university. But what about high school? And that depends on, as I already mentioned, from Canton to Canton. We have a Canton, from example, uh, in Geneva, we have a 35% of a cohort uh, going to gymnasium to high school. And in the Canton of Zurich, it's only 20% because there is a much higher selection uh, here. And yes, this is a problem and we have to, to work on that. And you also asked about the refugee uh, refugees. Um, so as far as I know, every refugee in Switzerland has a kind of integration budget. And this budget can be spent on various kinds of education. And the University of Geneva and the University of Zurich, we both have a, a refugee program. This is a program that educates uh, and, 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 and uh, kind of, uh, yeah, that, that, that has a language skills, that trains language skills in, in German and kind of prepares the refugees for studying at university or at least explaining the system and, and, and giving them good information for, for doing kind of good choices, what kind of career they want to, to choose. That is a kind of our contribution to, to kind of make the situation a bit better for the refugees. Mm -hmm. So, so far from my side. Thank you very much, Professor Siegert. And if I can compliment this, our former Secretary of Education, Swiss Secretary of Education, always saying that among his five kids, two of them only went to university, sons of um, sons and daughters of a, of a Secretary uh, of Education, and the ones that earned the highest salary are the ones that didn't go to university. And this has obviously a huge impact in uh, in Switzerland to your perspective of having a very successful career uh, doesn't depend on your salary expectation, don't depend on the fact that you're going to college. So it also plays a role, obviously, uh, when you look at the long term. Um, so Professor Bass, uh, the ball is on your hands now. We have a very difficult question. <laughs> Good luck with that one. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Catherine, for the question. And um, uh, and it's, of course, very challenging. And I think, I, you know, I, I, I have several quick responses. The first is that I think we need to take on the question of access and excellence. We need to sort of take a deep breath and, and, and somehow stay both urgent about it and understand that it's it's a long game that any any quick fixes will probably only make the situation worse in some way so it's it's maintaining a sense of focus but also understanding that it's a, it's a sy systems approach and a long game so i here's here's but here's now two or three specific responses to the question first as you were uh, as you were setting up the question you kept saying we are de trying to decolonize the university we are trying to change our pedagogy etc i would say the first uh, piece is is that we need to expand the we. I know that the we, as spoken by you and and your colleagues, means we. But there's there's many parts of the university for whom it's not yet a project to decolonize or to open or to make more equitable or to think about anti-racism in any way. So it's uh, part of it is to really continue to push to to say that this is an institutional value. And, and that has to come both from the bottom and the top of the institution. Um, second, I think, is to adopt a stance that this is a systemic strategy. So institutions need to organize themselves to say, how are we recruiting new kinds of faculty? How are we recruiting new kinds of students? How are we diversifying the graduate programs, which is a very different pipeline problem than getting from secondary schools to high schools, which of course starts building the longer pipeline for diverse faculty. Um, how are we creating a better climate so that students feel a sense of belonging when they're here and stay here? Um, and uh, so th those, are, those, are, th those are the kinds of approaches where one just has to say, this has to be 
a comprehensive and systems level approach. Each of those will have its own trajectory. Some will move at faster paces. Um, there's a uh, professor here at Georgetown, uh, Professor Bob Bees in the business school, who always uses the phrase, it's about direction, not distance, right? It's about direction, not distance. The key is just to keep moving in the right direction. Um, and then finally, I would say universities need to find the courage and, 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 and here's where I'm so glad that nobody else is listening, my boss or anything like that, that universities need to find the courage to push themselves, right? I, I, I think part of Chad Wellman's point is that we're not living up to our own values. We claim we are, we are to some extent, but we're really not pushing ourselves as much as we should. So pushing ourselves in terms of concept, pushing ourselves in terms of resources, and pushing ourselves in terms of our willingness to expand business models to reach new populations and to feel comfortable that, that our brand will survive if we expand our business models in new ways. And, and I, I think it's going to take all of that that I've mentioned in order to make progress toward this. There is, as any wicked problem, there is no single solution. Thank you, Professor Bass. You're you're talking about brands and 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 added value. Uh, so this is something that uh, that uh, we 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 also uh, share in in Switzerland. The reputation of the institution and um, um, taking you up to uh, to uh, the, the your aspect of of taking the courage to push uh, the university in the right direction. I would like to ask the, you both of you the question. On, uh, that was slightly um, touched upon in on the, the the role of the university of the higher education institution in this continuously evolving time, um, and if we look right now, um, the challenges of of environmental issues of climate is a huge one. Um, in your view, what is the role here of of higher education to address these specific challenges? Would it be on the education side, or how you can? A touch upon the the students with with that uh, with that point, and also on the research side. Uh, maybe you can start first, uh, Professor Siegert. Well, yes. Thank you very much for the question. So, to address these grand challenges, we need the best minds. We need critical thinkers, and we need problem solvers. And this is the task of the universities to prepare the students for that. Problem solving is, as, as, as uh, my colleague Randall said in his presentation, this is a, a, a context concept. This is not only gaining knowledge, but also practicing, working together in teams, taking into account the real world problems and not only, you know, Scientific disciplines sometimes are too, you know, too narrow-minded, focusing on their own discipline. Uh, being in this, in this, in this path, without seeing that for most of the problems, you need to to include different disciplines, and that is that is usually not what the universities are built of. The structure of the university is pretty disciplinary. You study, you study math, for example, and not uh, not a lot of other things. And we have kind of offering the students programs that also are more transdisciplinary oriented, more practical oriented, real dealing with real life problems, and 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 including a lot of diff disciplines. This is not an easy task. This is not an easy task for the colleagues usually think of their own discipline as the one and only um, for good reasons and do not think that there are various others that contribute also largely to, this, to the solution of a problem. Um, we at the University of Zurich, we, we kind of established a very small school for transdisciplinary studies and we try to offer programs or at least modules for, for example, dealing with sustainability in a multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary way. This is a very, very small, a sm very small, small, tiny school. Nevertheless, it's the first step, and we try to improve 
that. Thank you, Professor Sigurd. Uh, Professor Bass, any, any comments on this point? Yes, well, certainly I entirely agree uh, with, with uh, Professor Seeger's point about transdisciplinarity, um, interdisciplinarity, what the National Science Foundation would call a convergence approach to a very complex challenge where, where you're, you're bringing disciplines together in ways that are even inventing new ways to think about new ways to think about disciplines, right? So, so, so that, that's essential, I completely agree. I would add just two things. One is that I think universities which occupy space, um, often in very complex ecosystems, need to model sustainability practices, need to model those practices, both their students, the way they function as parts of the landscape, and to extend that modeling of sustainability to their surrounding communities, whatever kind of community a, an institution of higher education is. So, so that's also a, a thing that I think that in, universities are uniquely capable of, to, to shape what happens as an organization and to connect to the communities around us. And then the last thing I'll say that I think is also essential as a response is that it's all the disciplines that Professor Siegert mentioned, including, and I'm sure she would include these absolutely, all those parts of education that teach one cultural humility, that teach one imagination, that give one empathy, that will position us to respond to the world's most vulnerable people who will be differentially affected by climate change or climate apartheid, as people discuss, including the role for the arts um, in, in better understanding and communicating about climate. So, so it's, a, it's a truly transdisciplinary approach that really helps shape how it is that we respond to the world's most vulnerable people, because that has to be part of the environmental response. Thank you, Professor Bass. And I do see we have one question from the audience regarding uh, mobility. So we, and the ambassador mentioned how important is this mobility of students and these uh, people moving, but doing part of their studies in Europe, in the US is important also in terms of uh, shaping the minds uh, and tackling also these challenges, getting to get, um, to get a better cultural understanding. Um, we do have a question saying that it's usually very hard, for example, for a person with a U.S. high school diploma to get in a Swiss university uh, without having uh, to do a, a lot of, um, uh, um, well, well to, to have a lot of uh, requirements in terms of, uh, of um, access to, to Swiss university. Uh, so maybe this question would be for you, Professor uh, Siegert. Uh, has it changed? Is it still as much difficult to, to get in, in a Swiss university as a, with a U.S. Uh, high school diploma? And can you understand us why uh, and how, uh, how come it is uh, the case? Yes, in, in fact, uh, thank you for the question. In fact, it is not easy to access the university because the level is or the, the access criteria is uh, a Swiss baccalaureate or a equivalent certificate, a foreign certificate that equals this baccalaureate. And the Swiss certificate is a very high level one. We have 12 various subjects to, to graduate in and there is in, indeed a problem that people from foreign countries sometimes do not fit into the system because they, know, they do not equal at least six. six we, 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 we want to have six um, subjects, important subjects, and, and for example, mathematics is one of them, that have to be kind of uh, in your certificate. And the problem is that that some degrees do not do not equal that. And then we have a very strict rule: we do not uh, give those those applicants access to the university. And this is a strict rule for whole Switzerland. This is uh, very uh, very true. And uh, better to kind of. Um, study at, a, at a, uh, a university in the United States and try to do a mobility program with a Swiss university. That seems, in my opinion, the, the better and easier way to get access to the universities. Thank you, Professor Sigurd, for also providing us with a, a concrete recommendation on, on how to, to come and study in Switzerland. 
Um, I see the time is flying by. I have a last question for you um, before we wrap this up. Um, if uh, you had a, a, a magical wand and you could change one thing in your respective education system, so would it be in the US or in Switzerland, what would, you, what would it be? Just one wish uh, for your respective education system. And maybe we can start with, with you, Professor Sieg. Well, one wish that I then I would wish that we really focus on the best minds and to, to really base the selection on on performance and not on the parents' budget. Thank you, Professor uh, Sigurd, um, Professor Bass. I think my wish would be um, that we could rapidly convert the majority of instruction, especially at the, the broader introductory end of the most difficult courses, to team instruction, to, to or as Herbert Simon said, a, from a solo act to a team sport. I think if we, for the most part, stop thinking of university teaching as something an individual does, Uh, with one person and many students and thought of it instead as a, 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 as a team. And I don't just mean two faculty, but a whole team of people delivering a very complex experience for a very complex world that would change everything. And Catherine Sieg, um, you're bridging both for what, would you, what you would you wish you for, for the US and for Switzerland. And I believe you're being muted. Sorry. Oh, I would. What I would love to do is to have uh, all um, educational institutions free in the United States. <laughs> And any wish for Switzerland? So um, I believe we were wrapping up slowly, but surely uh, at the end of our panel. So. I remember that all of us should have the courage to change things. It's always difficult to move institution, no matter what kind of institution it is. So I take that as a as a take home message for for myself too, um, that we should educate uh, young people also at travel solving and not only at uh, at knowing things. Uh, I do believe this is this is important because there are many challenges to solve in this world and in the future, and also at breaking the silos between the disciplines and uh, trying to work together. This is uh, definitely something that's very important also uh, at work, between friends, in building a democracy. So I believe that this would be my three take home message from, from this panel. Um, so I would like to give you the floor back to Professor Kellerhaus. Uh, thank you very much for, for also letting me moderate this session with you uh, and I will let you finalize. Thank you very much, Anuk, and thank you very much to the three panelists. This, this was a wonderful, a great discussion. I would have loved to continue to listen to, to what you have to say, and we realize that we have you know, much too short time uh, limits here, and I, I just had the idea that maybe we should repeat such a conference a bit later on, because there's much more stuff we can debate on, on education in, in these two countries. So thank you very, very much for your uh, extremely valuable contribution. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this brings us already to the end of the Swiss day 2021-22. I hope uh, you liked the uh, edition and I would like to invite you back to come uh, when, back to uh, this program when we do the next Swiss day, which will probably be in, in fall 2022. At the end, I would like to thank the ambassador of Switzerland, uh, Jacques Pitlou, The two speakers, uh, Professor Siegert and Professor Bass, uh, also, of course, Professor Sieg for her excellent contributions during the panel discussion. Anouk, as I said, Anouk de Bass for a skillful uh, moderation, and everybody else who was involved in making this uh, event tonight uh, possible. Ladies and gentlemen, please come back and uh, all the very best. Stay healthy and goodbye. <laughs>